Good morning. Welcome to Zion. It is wonderful to see all of you here and also welcome to those joining us online. If you have an announcement to make, you can make your way up here to the front. Uh, one announcement I've been asked to share is that starting in April, we will be uh, staffing the nursery, which is exciting and good. And so if you are interested in signing up to help volunteer in the nursery, there's signups um, back in the back and we would appreciate you um, signing up for a Sunday. Yeah. Just a reminder that Mennonite women will be meeting this Thursday here at church at nine o'clock till about three o'clock or whenever you get tired and cranky and need to go home. Um, uh, the focus was sent out, I got mine Tuesday or Wednesday on an email from the church. So if you did not get your focus on your email, please let Jody know so she can be sure it's there and you can be informed. We will not yet do a potluck on Thursday. So bring your own sack lunch and wear your mask and we will try to get some good work done. Good morning. So take a look at your bulletin and there is a announcement about the camping trip um, that we've been doing. We called it off last year, but we're going to start it back up this year. Um, it's in late August. So take a look uh, at the bulletin announcement. I think it's kind of uh, it's tough to schedule um, to reserve campsites these days. It's pretty crazy. Um, but I was able to get 10 campsites and I think we have three tent sites and one trailer site left. So um, first come, first serve. Let me know. My, my contact info is in there, both email uh, and phone number. So thanks. Well, it's been a busy week in the news, to say the least. I've seen posts online. I've heard people talking at work. Our old family has been talking about things happening around the world, unsettling things happening in our country, in our state, in other states. It feels strange to stand in line at the grocery store, watch a soccer game, or even just to prepare a meal when we know there's others who are fleeing for their lives and wondering where their next meal will come from. And so I was preparing for this morning, thinking about how grateful I was to know that I was coming here with all of you um, to worship and be together when the future feels unclear. I want to share this call to worship today. It comes from an author named Amina Brown. I changed it a little bit to use the word we rather than I. We know we don't have all the answers, and we know we never will. Sometimes the best thing we can do is put our hands in the middle of our chest and feel the rhythm there. Turn down the noise in our minds, in our lives, and whisper, God, whatever you want to say, we're here, and we're listening. Let's sing together. So we have met to worship, so I ask you to um, join me and turn to number 25 in the um, Voices Together book. As we sing, brethren, we have met to worship. Number 25. Sisters, let us praise our God. Will you pray with all your power? Will you hear and preach the word? All is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. Christians, pray and holy man will be showered all Is there here a 
trembling jailer seeking grace and filled with fears. Is there here a weeping Mary pouring forth a flood of tears? Brethren, join your cries to help them. Sisters, let your prayers abound. Pray, oh, pray that holy manna will be scattered all around. Let us love our God supremely. Let us love each other too. Let us love and pray for sinners till our God makes all things new. All us home to heaven, at his table we'll sit down. Christ will gird himself and serve us with sweet men of all And turn to number 401. We've sung this song before, but we've never sung it out of this new hymnal. And Kristen has agreed to play the accompaniment, which she says the rhythm is a little bit different. So I don't know how this is going to go. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we're trying to get all the repeats figured out and everything, too. So anyway, let's just see how it goes. of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you. I want to see you, see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. The eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart. continuing to uh, collect offering in the back. You can use the new app, mail it in, bring it to the church, lots of options. Thank you for your faithfulness and continued giving. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for all the good things you have blessed us with. May we be faithful with what you have given us, and may you use us to bring your love and light into the world. At this time, feel free to stand and move around and share the peace of Christ with each other.
Our first scripture passage for this morning comes from Exodus 34, verses 29 to 35. Moses came down from Mount Sinai. As he came down from the mountain with the two covenant tablets in his hand, Moses didn't realize that the skin of his face shone brightly because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw the skin of Moses' face shining brightly, they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called them closer. So Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him, and Moses spoke with them. After that, all the Israelites came near as well, and Moses commanded them everything that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. And whenever Moses went into the Lord's presence to speak with him, Moses would take the veil off until he came out again. When Moses came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see that the skin of Moses' face was shining brightly. So Moses would put the veil on his face again until the next time he went in to speak with the Lord. Now this time the kids are invited up for their story time. coming. There's another one. All right. How are we doing this morning? Good. 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 There is a special time of year, a special season that's going to start this week on Wednesday. Well, what do you think it is? Yeah? Spring is a good guess. That's actually still a couple weeks away, I think. Yeah? This is a church season. This is something that we celebrate at church. No, but March does start this week. You're right. It definitely does start this week. Yeah, that's when my birthday is, too. And my brother's birthday. Yours, too? I don't think so. No, not Lottie's. You already had your birthday? Yeah, that's true. That's a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they only come once a year, right? Well, this only comes once a year, too, and it's called Lent. Have you ever heard of Lent? <laughs> no. Well, Lent... When it, Lent ends, there's a holiday, and it's called Easter. Have you heard of Easter? Yes. <laughs> yes, right. We've all heard of Easter, haven't we? Yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's Easter in just like six and a, six weeks. Yeah, no, six weeks of Lent, so seven weeks. Seven weeks, it'll be Easter? That's not that far away, huh? No, it's not that far away. Well, we have Lent. Yeah, we have... Almost, yeah. Almost two months. Lent is when we remember some special things about Jesus. It's like a special time, like before Christmas. Do we do special things before Christmas? Yeah, we do lots of special things before Christmas. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Sometimes we do special things at Lent, too, that help us to remember things that Jesus did. And on Wednesday, there's going to be a special church service here, and there'll be ashes. People will put ashes on their foreheads like this. Yeah, that helps them to remember Jesus. And it helps them to remember that we need Jesus. Yeah, we need Jesus all the time with us. So other people do other things at Lent. So I would like you guys to do something special this year during Lent. I would like you to try to do something nice for someone every week. Could you think you could do that? Just be nice to someone? 
Yeah? You're always nice? That, that is really good, Liesl. Yeah, it's good to always be nice, but it's not always easy. We talked about that in Sunday school today. Jesus did not always promise that it would be easy to be nice to everyone. Sometimes we see things on TV or we see things that people do and we think, oh, I just want to hit that person. Do you ever think that? No? Well, you probably don't watch enough TV. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, the news is, the news is kind of serious these days, isn't it? Yeah. It's hard sometimes. It's hard sometimes, and sometimes it's easy. So what do you think? How about somebody can tell me, can somebody tell me um, something nice that they did recently? Yes, Lisa? For somebody else. Maybe you just gave somebody a big smile or you held the door for them. You hold the door for your class. Okay. Yeah. I wrote, hold the door. You take the things back? You put the toys away? Does that mean that you put the toys away? Oh, in Sunday school, you take the things back at the end? Put things away, okay? So every Sunday during Lent, there'll be somebody up here telling you a story, and they will ask you what nice things you have done during the week, and then you tell them, they will put it up here. Yeah. Oh, that is a very nice thing to do. Very nice. Have a good evening. That's a very nice thing. Yeah. You give a hug? Yeah, that's a very nice thing. Did you want to say something too, Lisa? Oh, thank you. Okay. See, we're writing, say, say have a nice day. Or thank you. Yeah. Ooh. Okay, I don't remember. What was yours? No, his. Yeah, what did he say? A hug. Oh, right. Hugs. Hugs are always good. Okay. Okay, that's enough for this week. But you guys work on it this week, okay? Okay. Let's bow our heads and pray. Okay? Yeah, that was it. Let's bow our heads and pray. Jesus, be with us this week as we get ready to celebrate Lent, which is a special time for us to remember you. Okay. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, don't go anywhere wait, yet. Wait, wait. You guys wait, can help us out wait, with the song. Wait, wait, wait. There's a song. I came across <laughs> a song this week, and I decided it's time for us to sing it here in the sanctuary. And it's really a kid's song. It's a camp song. But these kids don't know it real well, but Chris practiced it with them in Sunday school. So we need everybody to sing. Anybody can do the motions. If I were a butterfly. All right? You guys look at Chris. Look out there. If I were a butterfly, I thank you, Lord, for giving me wings. 
If I were a robin in a tree, I'd thank you, Lord, that I could sing. And if I were a fish in the sea, I'd wiggle my tail and I'd giggle with glee. Could I just thank you, Father, for making me me? For you gave me a heart and you gave me a smile. You gave me Jesus and you made me your child. And I just thank you, Father, for making me me. If I were an elephant, I thank you, Lord, by raising my trunk. And if I were a kangaroo, you know I'd hop right up to you. And if I were an octopus, I thank you, Lord, for my fine looks. But I just thank you, Father, for making me me. For you gave me a heart and you gave me a smile. You gave me Jesus and you made me your child. And I just thank you, Father, for making me me. If I were a wiggly worm, I thank you, Lord, that I could squirm. And if I were a fuzzy wuzzy bear, I thank you, Lord, for my fuzzy wuzzy hair. And if I were a crocodile, I thank you, Lord, for my great smile. And I just thank you, Father, for making me me. For you gave me a heart and you gave me a smile. You gave me Jesus and you made me your child. And I just thank you, Father, for making me me. Thank you. That's fun. I haven't heard that one in a long time. <laughs> Our remaining scripture passage today comes from Luke 9. About eight days after Jesus said these things, he took Peter, John, and James and went up on a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes flashed white like lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, were talking with him, and they were clothed with heavenly splendor and spoke about Jesus' departure, which he would achieve in Jerusalem. Peter and those with him were almost overcome by sleep, but they managed to stay awake and saw his glory as well as the two men with him. As the two men were about to leave Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it's good that we're here. We should construct three shrines, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But he didn't know what he was saying. Peter was still speaking when a cloud overshadowed them, and as they entered the cloud, they were overcome with awe. Then a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Even as the voice spoke, Jesus was found alone. They were speechless and at the time told no one what they had seen. It's good to see you again. I know you've heard about it already in emails in the bulletin, but this week is our Ash Wednesday service. It's at 6 p.m. on, well, Wednesday. Service definitely has a message in it, but there will not be a sermon. Yay. The first 20 minutes or so of the service, it'll be all of us together uh, doing some reading, singing, hearing some scripture, and then there will be the optional time when we make the symbol of the cross on your forehead or the back of your hand with ashes. Again, that part, it's called the imposition of ashes, and it's completely optional. Uh, it's up to you whether that's something you want to participate in, in that service or not. Then after the first part of the service, you'll be invited to move around the room. We're gonna have probably about five different stations and there's gonna be inter interactive um, 
things to consider at each station, things to participate in. Each station will have a different activity for you to do while you reflect on themes like worship, prayer, discipleship, and forgiveness. All ages are welcome to participate. The Lord be with you. Desmond Tutu died this last December in Cape Town, the day after Christmas, December 26th, 2021. It would take too long to mention all that the 1984 Nobel Peace Prize winning Anglican priest did to contribute to our world, but here are a few highlights. He was born in 1931 into a poor family in Klerksdorp, South Africa. He studied theology at King's College in London, and in 1986, he became the Archbishop of Cape Town, the most senior position in the Southern Anglican, or sorry, Southern Africa's Anglican Church. He emphasized a consensus-building model of leadership and oversaw the introduction of female priests He's well known for his nonviolent and anti-apartheid activism. After then President F.W. de Klerk released the anti-apartheid activist Nelson Mandela from prison in 1990, Tutu and Mandela led negotiations to end apartheid and introduce multiracial democracy to South Africa. After the 1994 general election resulted in a coalition government led by Mandela, Tutu was selected to chair the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to investigate past human rights abuses committed by both pro and anti-apartheid groups. Here's a quote from Desmond Tutu. In the Bible, we first encounter God when he sides with a bunch of slaves against a powerful Pharaoh, an act of grace freely given. Transfiguration is a big word that means a change from one form to another, uh, something more beautiful, something more spiritual. We've skipped ahead a bit in case you didn't realize it in our study of the gospel according to Luke. We skipped ahead because today, the last Sunday before Lent, is Transfiguration Sunday, Change Sunday. We've got an early Easter this year, so we jumped right from chapter 6 to the middle of chapter 9. But it fits together with the season, so I decided to go with it. See, back on January 9th, when we began this season, we marked the first Sunday of Epiphany in ordinary time, with the green fabric you still see, and January 9th was the story of Jesus' baptism. That started off the season, and it makes sense to end the season with another epiphany about Jesus, about who Jesus is on Transfiguration Sunday. The season began with Jesus' baptism, with a voice from heaven saying to Jesus, You are my son whom I dearly loved. In you, I find happiness. And now the season comes to a close with another voice, the same voice, in a cloud saying, this time, to the people around and to us, this is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. Both events, the baptism and the transfiguration, they proclaim who Jesus is. There's a lot going here in this going on here in this text from Luke. I feel like I've been saying that almost every week since we've been going through Luke. I think I have. This week's passage, it's no different. So I've done my best to boil it down to just a few things this morning. But to get there, I've got to acknowledge some of the issues that have been coming up in the passages in Luke that we've skipped over. Mostly, those issues arise out of questions concerning the status of Jesus. Who is Jesus really? Jesus has been giving authority to the disciples to do miracles in his name, and it worked for the most part. The disciples, they're going around healing people. They're freeing people from bondage, and there's this guy, Herod, the ruler, the king. 
Herod was hearing about all these things that were happening and all these things that the disciples were doing and all these things that Jesus was doing, everything that was going on. And some people were saying John, the guy that Herod had killed, was raised from the dead. Others said the prophet Elijah had appeared and others had been saying one of the ancient prophets had come back to life. Herod had questions about who this guy really is. Luke's showing us that there was still significant questions all around about the status of Jesus. There were significant questions circulating about who he really was. Now, I get that it's tough for us to put ourselves in the position of hearing these questions because, well, we're on this side of Easter. Luke's already been establishing who Jesus is, and we've been following that, but In the story, the tension is growing among the crowds, the disciples and even King Herod, because no one is very confident about who Jesus is, except for Jesus. For the people in Nazareth, Jesus' hometown, the question we talked about a while ago is, is Jesus the son of Joseph or the son of God? For King Herod, the question shows up in chapter 9, verse 9. So now, who am I hearing about? In verse 18 and 20 of chapter 9, Jesus asks the questions very pointedly to his disciples. Who do the crowd say I am? Who do you say I am? In verse 33 of chapter 9, part of what was read just a minute ago, Peter calls Jesus master, showing that even Peter, who had recently been healing sick people in the name of Jesus, didn't clearly understand who Jesus was. See, by calling Jesus master, Peter isn't recognizing Jesus' status as the Son of God or the Messiah. So by calling Jesus master, Peter is simply recognizing Jesus holds a position of authority over him, like a boss or like someone Peter was working for. For Peter, master is not a sign that Jesus is the Son of God. It's into this situation of tension the situation about questions concerning who Jesus really is that Luke gives us this account of the transfiguration. As an Anglican bishop, along with winning the Nobel Prize for Peace, his work with the Truth and Reconciliation Committee and his nonviolent activism, Desmond Tutu was also known for being honest about questioning God. He was known for his honesty about his frustrations with organized religion and the church. When considering the slow process of justice, Tutu is quoted as saying, the universe can take quite a while to deliver. I can't help but appreciate those words when I think about events of this last week in Ukraine and all parts of our world that continue to struggle with conflict. But especially Ukraine. I'm worried about a friend I have from school who lives in Ukraine, Marina Yarmolenko. Marina is the head of the music ministry department at Ukrainian Evangelical Theological Seminary in Kiev. Last I heard, students and faculty from the school were taking shelter from the bombing in basements of campus buildings. I'm sure there are multiple connections here in the congregation to people in Ukraine. So I guess I can't help but find myself wondering, where is our God that works on behalf of the powerless and sets people free from their oppressors? While the invitation, while the invasion of Ukraine is fresh, The questions about why it takes so long for things to change is nothing new. Where is God in the midst of this violence and oppression this time? I think that's where we start to find ourselves in the midst of this text in Luke. All these questions about the status of Jesus. Is he really the son of God or just the son of Joseph? Jesus' questions to the disciples so many years ago, it's the same for us. Who does the crowd say I am? Who do you say I am? 
It's really a question of trust. What status does Jesus truly have? Do we trust Jesus enough to not only ask the tough questions, but do we continue to trust and follow when we don't see the evidence of the kingdom of God being fulfilled in our hearing like Jesus said it was? Instead, we see division or pain or people in need of liberation. Maybe for you this week, it, it wasn't the conflict in Ukraine. Maybe it's closer to home. Maybe it's in the midst of a denomination made up of people, you and me, wrestling with resolutions and the tension created in local congregations. The tension created between family members by the questions these resolutions call us to wrestle with. Maybe for you, the tension is felt by the ongoing strain COVID has put on you and those you work with. Or as I heard this morning, school lockdowns in the midst of trying to teach. No matter where the tension comes from, it's in the midst of that tension that we are faced with the nagging question that won't leave us alone. Who do you say I am? Is God big enough to see us through? all of these questions. In Luke's gospel, the answer to that question came quickly and pointedly. In the midst of these questions about Jesus' status, Luke tells us that while praying, Jesus' face was changed. His clothes flashed white like lightning, and two men, Moses and Elijah, showed up and they were talking to him. All clothed in splendor, they talked about Jesus' departure and what he would achieve in Jerusalem. Luke makes a point of using this word, departure. See, in the presence of Moses, and with so many of those reading this familiar story and their familiarity with the Old Testament, this word talking with Moses about departure would have read Exodus. At least that's what Luke is trying to point out to his readers. Jesus is now the one preparing people for an exorcist. I'm sorry, an exodus. <laughs> Two very different things, exodus and an exorcist. But I guess they both free people. So Jesus is now the one preparing people for an exodus, but the shape that exodus is going to take will be significantly different than the one Moses led the people out of Egypt from. Nonetheless, just like Moses, the exodus Jesus is preparing for is grounded in the purpose of God. This exodus, just like the one with Moses, is God drawing near to his people and bringing salvation and liberation and freedom from bondage. It's in the midst of this scene, Jesus talking about the exodus that's going to happen because of what would be achieved in Jerusalem, that Peter, still half asleep, groggy, throws out the suggestion to build something more permanent like a few structures so they can all hang out together and stay there. And before Peter is even done speaking, they're surrounded by a cloud and a voice that says from the cloud, this is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. Moses and Elijah suddenly disappear. That's it. All questions answered and put to rest, at least for a little while, for those that were around to see it. For the disciples, for Herod, for the crowd that we assume might have eventually got word, even though the passage tells us no one said anything. Jesus is 100% reliable, receives divine endorsement. Moses, Elijah, strange weather patterns, and a voice from inside that strange weather pattern just confirmed it. Jesus is reliable, 100%. Listen to what he teaches you. Of the many notable events in this passage, I've got three things I think Luke is trying to drive home for us. It's always three things. 
Just like those around to witness the event would have understood, Luke is telling his readers that Jesus is 100% reliable. In the midst of questions from King Herod, questions from the crowd, the folks back in Nazareth, questions from the disciples, questions asked to the disciples, Luke draws all of our attention in and makes the point that Jesus has God's complete and full stamp of approval. Jesus is 100% reliable. A reliable source to understand what God is working to accomplish. And the announcement has now been made publicly. Jesus is God's son. So, number one, Jesus is 100% reliable. Two, with everything going on here, it's easy to miss. But there's a great significance in the presence of Moses and Elijah. Also, their quick departure. Luke simply says, even as the voice spoke, Jesus was found alone. Doesn't say how they left or even how they showed up. Moses and Elijah vanished as quickly as they appeared. And they vanished right at the moment the voice of God fully sanctioned Jesus' status and mission, saying to the disciples, listen to him. So not only is Jesus 100% reliable, but number two is this. Even Old Testament figures like Moses and Elijah are interpreted by Jesus. Luke has been careful to show that Jesus fully participated in the Jewish faith. Jesus had not come to abolish the Jewish faith, nor had he come to completely get rid of Old Testament law. But with Jesus on the scene, the 100% reliable Jesus, who is God's son, Jesus shows us how to interpret and understand the Old Testament and the law. The time of the law has not passed, but Jesus has been designated as the authorized interpreter of that law. So, one, Jesus is 100% reliable. Two, Old Testament figures and the law are now interpreted through Jesus. Listen to him. And three, the new exodus. Jesus' mission, whatever shape it takes, is grounded in the purpose of God. It's there in the words from Desmond Tutu I read at the beginning. In the Bible, we first encounter God when he sides with a bunch of slaves against a powerful Pharaoh. An act of grace freely given. The purpose of God is to bring salvation, to bring liberation from bondage to all God's people everywhere. And that liberation is what Jesus is discussing here with Moses and Elijah. That liberation that would be accomplished in Jerusalem. But Jesus' way of going about liberation, it's different than what they expected. Jesus' mission was different than what the people around him thought he was going to do and Guess what? There's a good chance that what Jesus is up to today just might look different than what we expect. Our job isn't to figure out exactly what shape Jesus' mission will take. Our job in this passage of scripture, just like the voice says from the cloud, is to listen to him. In the midst of the tension we face, a tension that causes us to consider who do you say I am? No matter where that tension is coming from, the suffering around us, our personal doubts, pain in the world, war, racism, or the continued division that seems to grow exponentially on a daily basis. This passage in Luke reminds us, Jesus is 100% reliable. That Jesus shapes how we understand the Old Testament, and that Jesus has come to accomplish God's agenda, drawing near to his people so they might experience the fullness and blessings of salvation. Lord, thanks for your word. Thanks for authors like Luke. 
Thanks for the questions that you ask that make us uncomfortable. As we consider those questions, as we consider the question of who we say you are, as we consider just the, the struggles of, of pain, of war, of disappointment, um, in the midst of those things, help us to rely on you, to listen to you, and to draw close to you. Amen. I'd invite you to stand as we sing this song, number 716, in Voices Together, God of Grace and God of Glory. 716. God of grace and God of glory, on thy people pour thy power. Round thine ancient church's story, bring its bud to glorious flower. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the facing of this hour. For the facing of this hour. Lo, the of evil around us, <clears throat> assail his ways from the fears that long have bound us. Free our hearts to faith and praise. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the living of these days. For the living of these days. Cure thy children's warring madness. Bend our pride to thy control. Shame our want and selfish gladness. Rich in things and poor in soul. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, lest we miss thy kingdom's goal. Lest we miss thy kingdom's goal. Save us from weak resignation to the evils we deplore. Let the search for thy salvation be our glory evermore. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, serving thee whom we adore. Serving thee whom we adore. In your bulletin, you'll find a responsive reading. This is written by Kayla Craig. She wrote a book called To Light Their Way. It's a book of liturgy. And this week, she um, shared this prayer for Ukraine. So we'll all read the bold parts together. O oh God of peace, our hearts are heavy, and our brains can barely keep up with the breaking news. We don't know what to say or what to do in a world so wounded. So we come to you with hearts heavy for all who sit in the crossfires of violence and acts of war. O oh God of peace, be with the people of Ukraine, with the mothers who carry babies to subway shelters, and with the fathers who hold their heads in their hands with the children who absorb the traumas of violent acts of powerful men. O oh God of peace, we don't know the words to pray. 
For a warring world and all who are vulnerable in it, we don't pretend to know the extent of the damages of what tomorrow or today will bring. But we know that you are a God of peace and we can't bomb our way to shalom. O oh God of peace, comfort the crying and heal the hurt. Tend the aching and soothe the fearful. Make us instruments of your peace creating a sacred symphony where rhythms of grace are danced upon and evil has lost its sting now and forevermore. O oh God of peace, hear our prayer. Let's stand. And now go in peace to love and serve the world. Amen.